the last thing we had a lively discussion a couple of weeks ago about the, the one of the benefits of Shabbos observance uh, for the Jewish people or the the mitzvah of Shabbos is not even for the spiritual benefits we put that in one category but it's also for the preservation of the Jewish people and that's where we had invoked Achad Ha'am we had this very interesting conversation um, <clears throat> but I I want to put that in the context of every of the place where we are in this in this particular section in the book. Rabbi Yehuda Hadlevi here is dividing the mitzvot into different categories, and there there's there are so many different ways that the commentators <laughs> divide the different types of mitzvot: chukim, mishpatim, edot. We're familiar with those terminologies. A chok is a mitzvah which really defies. Uh, logic, at least at face value. Uh, a mishpat is uh, something that is uh, c- having to do with uh, civics and proper moral conduct between man and his fellow man. A dot are mitzvot that are testimonials, are, are reminders of historical events. <clears throat> he started with the, the mitzvah of bris milah which is something that he says defies logic at face value. And yet, it is something that was accepted by the Jewish people, accepted with joy, and it is an example of something that not only is not rationally understood at face value, but also is in the context of what a pious person practices in the course of his life. And we're really, this is the topic, the topic of the third essay, is what is the behavior of the pious Jew? And what is his motivation for doing the mitzvot that the pious person performs? And it's in this context that we have to appreciate that there are certain mitzvot that at face value, we don't truly appreciate why we do them. And yet, sometimes only in retrospect, sometimes using a very, very wide panoramic lens of retrospect, do we have an appreciation for why these mitzvot were given to the Jewish people. And this is why I believe that Rismila and Shabbos are presented back to back in the way that Rabbi Yehuda Levi presents them. Now certainly we can distinguish between Rismila and Shabbos as far as the type of mitzvah they are using the categorization that we just mentioned. Bris Mila is a covenantal commandment, but also the details of why God said to do circumcision in the specific place where it's supposed to be done really doesn't have a logical explanation, although that many comment, that's at least Rabbi Huda Levi's thesis, although many commentaries do provide uh, reasons that are quite sound. But Shabbos is a testimonial to creation Shabbos is a testimonial, as he said, to Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, to the Exodus. So what is really the connection between the two? It, it is interesting that both of these mitzvot are identified by the Torah as ot, as, an, as a symbol or a sign. <clears throat> Zos os beris, this is the sign of the, of the bris, of the covenant. And ki osi beini uvenechem, Shabbos is an os, is a sign. So what is the sign or symbol that both of these represent? I think for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, <clears throat> the os that both of these stand for is the preservation of the Jewish people. What has kept the Jewish people alive and distinct and prevented from assimilating? And it's in this context that he talks about Shabbos. Brismila is a mitzvah as we mentioned, for Rabbi Yudha Levi, we don't understand why Davka, in the way that it was given, if God wants us to make a marking on our body to identify us, why in this way? So the answer is, is because even though it defies understanding, but in some way, in a retrospective way, we can see how in certain periods of Jewish history, the circumcision was the one thing that distinguished Jews from the rest of the population. And it was the one thing that prevented us from assimilating in the times of Hellenism, in the times of the Greeks. Shabbos, like we read from Achad Ha'am, more than the Jews have observed the Shabbos, or has kept the Shabbos, the Shabbos has kept the Jews. 
it is something that um, has preserved our, uh, our um, uniqueness and has prevented us from being completely obliterated as a people. We would have been drafted into their armies. We would have been forced to work and would have been completely assimilated were it not for the mitzvah of Shabbos observance. And so it's caused us a lot of grief over the centuries because it's inhibited our ability to prosper financially in certain sectors and in certain periods of history. But in the long run, it's been the most, it's been the key to our preservation and the key to our enrichment as well. And so that's really where we're up to, is that, yes, there are mitzvahs that when you look at them and you read them for the first time, you may say to yourself, why is this so important and why is it prescribed in the way that it's prescribed? And part of the answer is, although he doesn't say so explicitly, but contextually I think you get that gist, is that that's the key to the preservation of the Jewish people. Hashem knew exactly what was needed uh, and he foresaw all of the his historical iterations that we would go through. And Hashem knew exactly what we would need, what kind of commandments would be necessary to sustain us for these long, dark periods of our history. Um, okay. Um, so th that's where we're up to. We're up to this bottom paragraph on page 277. Were it not for these days, all your efforts would go to other people. Because all that you have in the diaspora is in constant danger of being despoiled by your captor nations. By contrast, whatever efforts you make for these days benefits you not only in this world, but also in the world to come, since your expenditures for these days are for the sake of heaven. So what he's essentially saying is that we toil and toil and toil in many different times in our history. And ultimately what happens is, is that things get confiscated from us. Things get taken away from us. But the one thing that they can never take away from us is that Shabbos table. And that he means that in two ways. Number one, experientially, what we have on a Shabbos is so, um, is so emotionally special to us and so spiritually special to us that no matter what else is going on in the world outside, that they can never take that away. And in the second way he means that is that think of the reward that awaits us in the world to come. We may forfeit all else in this world, but the tremendous reward of one who observes the Shabbat and keeps it and, uh, and, uh, and honors it in the proper way is immeasurable. And so those are great words of encouragement um, for those who have gone through periods of uh, persecution in Jewish <laughs> history, including Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. I mean, uh, although we reflect back upon the time that he lived uh, as part of the golden age of Spanish Jewry, it is important to know that Rabbi Huda Levi, towards the end of his life, was living in a Spain that was not as hospitable to Jews as it was when he was a younger man. And there, there was a, a rise of a very um, of, uh, antagonistic and violent type of Islam that was on the rise, known as the Almohads, who had come in from Africa and had really come up with this more fundamentalist version, which was really the cause of so many Jews eventually having to uh, leave Spain uh, in, the, uh, in the 12th century. Uh, that's why um, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Maimon, the father of the Rambam, had to take his family and leave Spain and move to Cairo, move to Egypt because of the things were getting progressively worse in the 12th century. Rabbi Yudha Levi, as a younger man, lived, still lived in a time of relative calm and peace, but things were getting worse and worse for him. It's fascinating, uh, having just come back from uh, Munich and Berlin over this past week, we, um, we visited a courtyard in Berlin. It's just basically an empty courtyard. And it's famous for two things, this courtyard. Uh, one thing it's famous for is that um, uh, there were, uh, in 1943, I believe is the year, um, uh, 
Hitler, you know, Berlin was the most cosmopolitan city in all of Germany. And that was specifically the reason why the Nazis made it their base of operations, because they knew that it was uh, the, the city that had the most progressive and liberal attitudes. And so they wanted to make sure that they could control the most uh, opposed uh, the most opposed ideologies, keep them close. And so that's why, you know, Berlin, Berlin Jews, by and large, were not exterminated in the camps. They were expelled, and they were given time to flee and to run away. But there were many Jews who remained in Berlin during the war, primarily because they were married to non-Jewish spouses. And the Nazis allowed it, tolerated it, because there were many because of their intermarriages to their spouses. And, but then finally, uh, uh, um, Hitler and his henchmen came to the decision that it was time to round up those Jews as well and deport them. And so they rounded them up in this courtyard in this area, and, um, and they were preparing them. I think it was about 13,000 uh, Jews were being prepared for, uh, for deportation. And uh, there was a whole demonstration of all of the non-Jewish spouses and children and many of the other citizens, just regular citizens of Berlin who demonstrated. And because of that, uh, they were able to get uh, a reprieve for these uh, Jews and they were able to be sent home. It doesn't really fit in into the narrative of <laughs> why intermarriage is so terrible for the Jewish people. But it's just an interesting... <laughs> Just an interesting facet of World War II history. But the other thing that this courtyard is famous for um, is that it was the place of the, um, the oldest synagogue in Berlin that was built in the uh, 1800s. Um, Jews came, in, came to Berlin, I believe, in the 1600s. And already in the 1700s, they had plans for, for, for a synagogue. And then they built a grand edifice. But even the grand edifice, had to be lower than the, uh, the, the church steeples. And so the, the dilemma that they had was, how were they going to build a nice shul with an Ezra Snashim balcony and still stay lower than the church uh, steeples? So they had to dig underground and so that you'd have to go down in order to get to the entrance so that the men's section was partially underground and that way the building could have an Ezra Snashim. We don't, we only have pictures of that building. It was completely bombed out in 1945 and completely destroyed. Um, but that's just one example of how, you know, in Europe today, the shuls that exist from before the war are primarily those shuls that were not the grand edifices, standalone edifices, because the standalone edifices were destroyed by the Nazis or by the Allied bombing. It's the, it's the, um, it's the shuls that were set up in neighborhoods that were inconspicuous, that were hidden in order to, for security reasons, and the Nazis didn't feel that they could destroy those shuls because it would burn down all of the surrounding homes, which they felt was a, just a, a terrible waste. So those are the shuls that are preserved. And there's an ongoing controversy about shuls in Europe, ongoing even today. You go to Munich, and there's a standalone shul, right, with very, very tight security in order to get in. But you go to many other communities in Europe, and there are shuls that are completely unmarked, like in Paris and in many other cities. Um, and you go and, and, uh, and you go to those, you, you're given an address, and I've spoken to many tourists who have gone to these places and they get to the, they get to the shul, they can't tell it's a shul. They can maybe, maybe see a tiny little mezuzah on the door, but there's no writing, there's no sign, there's nothing. They knock on the door and then uh, someone opens the door from behind the glass window, you know, usually it's Israeli security, and, uh, and then they ask you a bunch of questions and eventually let you in. These are the types of, um, of religious persecution that the Jewish people lived under. The type of, um, 
it's a mindset that's very that's very foreign to us to be to have to hide a synagogue in order to be able to feel a sense of security that you can go and daven there without uh, without fear of uh, reprisal. Um, but that's the kind of uh, of mindset that Rabbi Yehuda Levi is writing from, where he says that the, the preservation of the Jewish people. The key to that is Shabbos. Without Shabbos, we wouldn't, not only would we not have uh, Shabbos observance without Shabbos, what's the one day of the week where no one's working and they can go to shul and gather in a synagogue? You know, we, we, we take that for granted, that the entire social fabric of the Jewish community revolves primarily around Shabbos and Yom Tov. And with, if we didn't have Shabbos and Yom Tov, not only would we not have the in intrinsic holiness of those days, but we also wouldn't have a social fabric either. Sometimes the social fabric isn't so healthy. You still have the uh, you still have the JFKers, you know, JFK, just for kiddish, just, just for kiddish people, you know. So that's, uh, yeah. uh, but, um, and that's unfortunately that's an unfortunate uh, unfortunate uh, fallout from people who feel that they don't feel a spiritual connection to Shabbos, but at least they feel a social connection to Shabbos and to the Jewish people. But at least it provides something, it provides some level of connection. So, yes, Mrs. Sachachevsky, did you want to say something? Oh, um, I was just wondering if you had any reservations before you went about going to Germany, and I know most people don't, agree with the way I feel because people go back to those places but I just feel like as you take steps in that country don't you hear like how can you even be there when I hear a commercial on the radio that says Volkswagen Das Otto I don't like it and just hearing a German accent makes me cringe yeah. so I'm just wondering if that gave you pause. Oh, gave me tremendous pause. I'm, we're gonna, we're, we're, uh, I spoke about it this past Shabbos in Shul, and I'm going to speak about it more this Saturday night. We're having a Malava Malka. Uh, one of our members, Ed Prucci, and I were part of this very small delegation that was uh, picked by Sija to go uh, to, uh, to Germany. And it's, it was, it was, we were guests of the German government, actually. They, they, they paid for the trip. And this is part of the penance that uh, Germany is, is trying to do since 1945. They know we'll never forgive them. It's just that they want us to see that they're, they're preserving the memory of the Holocaust. And they also want us to see that Jewish communities are flourishing in Germany now. One of the things that we saw, and I'm not, I'm not uh, avoiding your question, I'm just trying to tell you that it's tremendously conflicting. Uh, even after I was relieved to get out of the country while even though, felt, even though I felt it was important to go. Um, and I also cringe when I, first thing I, first thing I, I encountered, for those of you who followed me on Facebook, the first thing I encountered when landing in Munich was a sign that said, take a shower. And that was pretty eerie, because they have free showers uh, in uh, the Munich airport, which is a great service. I mean, if you're traveling for 12 hours and you wanna have to go to a business meeting, you want to be able to take a shower, but for a Jew who lands in Germany for the first time, it means something totally different, right? Or if, you, um, if you're taking a train to Dachau, right, that has a totally different meaning, or to any, any other city as a to where there was a concentration camp. We drove through, there is an actual city, Dachau. It's outside of Munich. And so we passed by a, hard, a hardware store, like a Home Depot, and it says, number one in Dachau. I mean, it's like that, like number one in Dachau. What is that? That just that grates on you. Like uh, I can't even, you know, I, there's no, words can't even describe it. So yes, so so there's a lot of that. But you know, they just opened up a Lakewood Kollel in Berlin, in the Hildesheimer Yeshiva Rabbinical College, and uh, I, I I know one of the young men from Los Angeles who just moved to Berlin to, with his family to be part of the Lakewood Kollel. So. You've got, you've got multiple facets there. Very, very complicated, very complex. And um, I'm not uh, saying that it's a trip for everyone to take, but I do think that, let's say, rabbinic leaders of communities perhaps should venture out and sort of take that risk and, and take a look for themselves. But yes, it's, uh, 
it's uh, it's very grating and very eerie and uh, yeah, it's very uh, very very complicated. Yeah. Um, the issue, for, the emotional issue for me, uh, when I saw some of your postings, not only yours but all these memorials. There's something about I don't know. What, it's it's emotional for me. So. <clears throat> Oh, well, is it a, mor a memorial and that's it? They'll put a memorial and that's it? What else are they doing? Let's say, I actually had a distant relative who was um, who escaped from the Munich Olympics. He actually spoke in Toronto. Um, oh, you see the runner, he, the, the uh, sprinter? He was the coach. The coach. Mm -hmm. um, and so he spoke mm -hmm. with, with me. Anyway, so that was, that was what got me, frankly, these memorials. Yeah. They're spending so much money on, and will that do it? Type of thing. It's just a, it's an emotional yeah. response. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've a lot to say. <laughs> and now's now's not the time. What time now's is it? Malava Malka? Eight, eight, eight o'clock uh, this Saturday night okay. for Malava Malka. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So this leads us to paragraph number eleven, where the rabbi says, "Let us return to our prior discussion." And again, this is putting it in the context of the, of the chassid, of a pious person, a saintly person. The saintly person is careful in all of these divine matters. Remember the word divine, right, with what, uh, what he says, the mitzvot elah ha-devarim ha-elokiyim. Elokiyim means matters that pertain in my relationship to God, that sometimes transcend, at least the details of the mitzvah, transcend logic. And so... Um, we go back to the examples of circumcision, of Shabbos and, and Yom Tov observance, and all of their respective laws which were commanded by God. He protects himself from sinful acts such as forbidden intercourse, forbidden mixtures and plants, clothing and animals, and the Shemitah and Yovel years. Um, the commentaries grapple with the way that Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi lists many of these mitzvahs. Um, there doesn't seem to be um, a seder. There doesn't seem to be an order in the way that he categorizes or lists these mitzvahs. And so what I'm going to do is not going to get, we're not going to allow ourselves to get bogged down by the way that he orders these. But he basically points out that there are so many areas of mitzvah observance that a pious person sort of has to be careful about. Um, and anything from the very emotional to the very prosaic and detached. So it, forbidden relationships on the one hand, forbidden mixtures and plants, clothing and animals, shatnes, Shemitah and Yovel. Now, as you're going to go through this list, we're going to see that a lot of the things that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi addresses are not even pertinent in the 12th century, let alone in the 21st century. But he's giving us, and that's what I point out in footnote uh, 36, Nevertheless, the rabbi includes them because a semblance of every mitzvah, even the sacrificial laws, remains extant even in exilic times. When we study these laws and attempt to invoke the mental images and spiritual benefits that are bound up with them, we are rewarded as if we had actually brought the sacrifices and done all of the other mitzvahs. So we'll just read through them a little bit more quickly than we normally would. Uh, Next paragraph, he protects himself from idolatry and whatever is related to it. Um, and so we can certainly relate to certain aspects of idolatry that may exist even today, um, such as uh, walking into a, a church or kneeling before a statue and things like that. He protects himself from using methods other than prophecies, the Urim and Tumim, or reliable dreams to seek out hidden knowledge, not going to fortune tellers or not holding seances, etc., Namely, he does not listen to a diviner, a charmer, a soothsayer, or an enchanter. And these are all specific terms that uh, he's referencing in, in, that are based in Psukim in the Torah. He protects himself from different sources of impurity, such as menstrual flow and abnormal discharges, eating or touching impure animals, and leprosy. And he protects himself from consuming blood and chalev fats because they are only for God's fire. Forbidden foods and forbidden portions of kosher animals like the blood and the fat. He's always careful to bring the proper sacrifices for his sins, be they intentional or unintentional. In addition to his obligatory donations to the temple of his first burnt animals, his first fruits, the sacrifice brought after a woman gives birth and for abnormal discharges and the animal and flower sacrifices for leprosy. 
most of these are not applicable, but as he said before, when we study about them and we think about them, that actually adds benefit. He brings all these in addition to his standard obligations concerning the first and second tithes, the poor man's tithe, the festival sacrifices three times annually, the Pesach sacrifice with all its details, which is a divine sacrifice that all Jews must bring or suffer a serious penalty, and the mitzvahs of dwelling in the sukkah, taking the lulav and blowing the shofar. He's also careful to be in a state of purity when handling the vessels and holy instruments that are used in bringing the animal and flower sacrifices, and he's careful to maintain his obligatory uh, state of holiness and purity while offering the karbanot. He's also careful, he also carefully observed the laws about not shaving certain areas of the face and head, about not harvesting his fruit trees during the first three years, that's Orla, and about the obligation to eat the fruit of the tree's fourth year in Jerusalem. In general then, and this is where we're up to, page 281, he makes every effort to be careful in areas of the divine so that he will be able to honestly say, Lo avarti mi mitzvosecha velo shachachti. I have not violated any of your mitzvos, and I have not forgotten. And this is part of the confessional that a person makes when he brings, uh, uh, in the third and sixth year, when he brings, uh, he does something called vidui meiser, he comes to the temple and says, I have completely cleared out my house of all of my tithes and do, and, and uh, everything that I owe, all of the carbonos that I was supposed to bring, all of the things that I, have, that I have a duty to perform to Hashem and to donate to the temple, I have done all of these things. So, in brief, essentially, he's very careful about all mitzvot ase and mitzvot lo ta'ase. And as I mentioned, I'm not, it's not really clear why he chooses these examples. Uh, one of the, Rabbi Yehuda Moskato, who's the 16th century commentator to, uh, the, to the Kuzari called Kol Yehuda, basically says it, like when he reads it, it looks like a forest of trees, of just various different mitzvot that he's plucked out as examples of many, many more mitzvot that he could have chosen as examples, but these are sort of what stand out to him, a sort of, you know, primary mitzvot that a person should try to keep in mind. Okay. I think we're going to hold it here for today. And, yes. Yes. He addresses this, like, you're addressing it in this, the whole uh, essay as to the saintly person. Yes. Right? So why is he addressing it? Like, when I think of it, initially when you, it's addressed to the saintly person, I honest, I don't really, it, I look at it as a, as a separate category, not the general Jew. That's how it initially hits me. So, like, why is he addressing it to the saintly person rather than to... Jews in general should be like this, isn't that really what he means? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. I, I think he's, um, y you have to remember who was asking the question and who's answering the question. Um, at the very end, at the very end of the second essay is really where the Khazar king says, I'd like to ask you now, he says, I'd like to ask you to explain to me your portrayal of a servant of God. What is an Eved Hashem? And this is really Rabbi Huda Levi's answer. An Eved Hashem is a person, and maybe the word pious is not really the correct word, but it's a person who basically puts aside all of his own interests and says, I'm going to devote my life to Hashem. That's what I really think in the context of the person who questions and the person who answers. This is what I think he means when he's talking about the Hasid. It's a person who truly, really basically is, devotes himself to, completely to Hashem and says, my needs and my desires and my aspirations are secondary, and these are my primary interests as being the Eved Hashem. So that's why I think he uses the word Hasid. Okay?